Welcome back to another video. In today's video, we're going to continue the Try Hack Me series on the introduction to cybersecurity learning path. In today's video, we're going to cover intro to defensive security and related topics such as threat intelligence, SOC or security operations center, DFIR or digital forensics and incident response, and then SIM. Now on to task number one, introduction to defensive security. Offensive security focuses on one thing, and that's breaking into systems. Breaking into systems might be achieved through exploiting bugs, abusing insecure setups, and taking advantage of unenforced access control policies, among other things. Red teams and penetration testers specialize in offensive security. Now, defensive security is the opposite of offensive security, and is concerned with two main tasks. Number one is preventing intrusions from occurring. For example, this could be a malicious actor trying to brute force your login page. You want to block that IP from continuing to brute force your login page. Another method would be to lock out that user account after a certain amount of failed login attempts. Number two, detecting intrusions when they occur and responding properly. For example, let's say you're a US-based company and one of your engineers that lives in the US logs in from China. This can raise concerns and you would be alerted by this incident in your SIM tool as you would have logs feeding into your SIM tool, and then your SOC analyst would be alerted by this sign-in attempt in China. From there, you could either take action by disabling that user account or reaching out to that user to see if they're traveling to China, maybe they're on vacation, or maybe that account has actually been compromised. Blue teams are part of the defensive security landscape. Some of the tasks that are related to defensive security include user cybersecurity awareness. So training users about cybersecurity helps protect against various attacks that target their systems. For example, we have a phishing training video out there that helps users identify and how to respond to phishing attempts. Let's say you get a phishing email in your inbox. The video will actually show users how to identify whether the contents within the email is malicious or legitimate. So this is an example of cybersecurity awareness training. Next one is documenting and managing assets. We need, to know, we need to know the types of systems and devices that you need to manage and protect properly. If you don't know what assets to protect, you may miss some of the assets out there and these could be low hanging fruits that are unprotected that malicious actors could take advantage of and infiltrate your network. Next one's updating and patching systems. You want to ensure that computers, servers, and network devices are correctly updated and patched against any known vulnerabilities. These are also weaknesses. Setting up and preventative security devices, firewall, and intrusion prevention systems, IPS, are critical components of preventative security. Firewalls control what network traffic can go inside and leave the system or network, so inbound, outbound. IPS blocks any network traffic that matches preset rules and attack signatures. Next one, setting up logging and monitoring devices. Without proper logging and monitoring of the network, it won't be possible to detect malicious activities and intrusions. If a new unauthorized device appears on your network, then you should be able to know and you should be notified. So there's a lot when it comes to defensive security and this is just a few common topics that we discussed. So in this room, we're going to cover SOC or Security Operations Center, Threat Intelligence, Digital Forensics and Incident Response, and Malware Analysis. Now we have a question. Which team focuses on defensive security? That would be your blue team. Now just to touch upon defensive security. So defensive security focuses on protecting information systems from attacks by implementing preventative measures, detecting threats, and responding to incidents. Unlike offensive security, which aims to find and exploit vulnerabilities, defensive security aims to safeguard systems and data against potential threats. Now, there are a few roles in defensive security or blue team. Number one would be security analysts. These, would, these are the type of people that work in security operations center. They monitor networks and system for security breaches and investigate incidents. So they analyze security alerts, respond to incidents, and conduct vulnerability assessments as well. Some of the skills that a SOC analyst may have or security analyst may have is network monitoring tools, being able to use various different tools, incident response, and threat analysis. Number two, security engineer. So these professionals design and implement secure network solutions. So they could configure security systems like your SIM tool, let's say Splunk, 
They can develop security policies and conduct risk assessments. Next role is incident responder. So this is like DFIR. So these are the type of professionals that manage and mitigate security incidents. So their responsibility is to identify, analyze, and respond to security breaches and conducting forensic investigations. Next one will be a security architect. These are the type of profession, these professionals design and oversee the implementation of network and system security structures. So they could create security frameworks, evaluate new security technologies. Let's say you have a new vulnerability scanner you want to use. They'll help evaluate if this is the right tool for the job. They ensure compliance with security policies as well. Gain experience by doing try hack me or hack the box, getting in there, finding blue team style rooms, not even blue team. You could do offensive. You could do all sorts of rooms. It's, it's, it helps to understand the both sides of things, red team and blue team. You also want to network and get involved in the community and meet other blue teamers or defensive security professionals out there. And then, of course, continuously learning and staying up to date. Now, in this task, we'll cover two main topics related to defensive security. Security Operations Center, where we cover threat intelligence, and then Digital Forensics and Incident Response, where we cover malware analysis. So Security Operations Center, a Security Operations Center is a team of cybersecurity professionals that monitors a network and a system to detect malicious cybersecurity events. Some of the main areas of interest for a SOC are vulnerabilities. This is when a system vulnerability is discovered or a weakness in a system. It's essential to fix it by installing proper updates or patches. And if a fix is not available, then you need to have some kind of mitigating controls in place or compensating controls that will help mitigate this vulnerability. For example, let's say you have FTP on one of your servers, you want to disable that from being accessed from the external world, maybe set up a IP based rule set in place so that way only a few people can access that FTP server. That's just one simple example. Next one is policy violations. We think we can think of security policy as a set of rules required for the protection of networks and systems. For example, it might be a policy violation if users start uploading confidential company data to online storage services. Next one, unauthorized activity. Consider the case where a user's login name and password is stolen. An attacker uses them to log into the network. A SOC needs to detect such events and block it as soon as possible before further damage is done. Next one is network intrusions. No matter how good your security is, there's always a chance for an intrusion. An intrusion can occur when a user clicks on a malicious link or when an attacker exploits a public server. Either way, an intrusion occurs, we must detect it as soon as possible to prevent further damage. Now, threat intelligence. Intelligence refers to information you gather about actual and potential enemies. A threat is any action that can disrupt or affect a system. Threat intelligence aims to gather information to help the company better prepare against potential adversaries. The purpose would be to achieve a threat-informed defense. Different companies have different adversaries. Some adversaries might seek to steal customer data from a mobile operator. However, some adversaries are interested in halting the production in a petroleum refinery, for example. This example, adversaries include a nation-state cyber army working for political reasons and a ransomware group acting for financial purposes, based on the company or the target that we can expect adversaries. Intelligence needs data, so data has to be collected, processed, and analyzed. Data collection is done from local sources such as network logs and public sources such as forums. Processing of data aims to arrange them in a format suitable for analysis, so the analysis phase seeks to find more information about the attackers and their motives. Moreover, it aims to create a list of recommendation and actionable steps. Now, digital forensics and incident response. So this section is about digital forensics and incident response, where we'll cover digital forensics, incident response, and malware analysis. Now, digital forensics. Forensics is the application of science to investigate crimes and establish facts. With the use and spread of digital systems such as computers and smartphones, a new branch of forensics was born to investigate related crimes, computer forensics, which later evolved into digital forensics. 
In defensive security, the focus of digital forensics shifts to analyzing evidence of an attack and its perpetrators in other areas such as intellectual property theft, cyber espionage, and possession of unauthorized content. Digital forensics also focuses on different areas such as file systems, analyzing a forensic image or a low-level copy of a system storage reveals much information such as installed programs, created files, partially overwritten files, and deleted files. Then you have system memory. If the attacker is running their malicious program in memory without saving it to the disk, taking a forensic image of the system memory is the best way to analyze its contents and learn about the attack. Then you have system logs. Each client and server computer maintains different log files about what's happening. Log files provide plenty of information about what happened to the system. Some traces will be left even if the attacker tries to clear their steps. And then you have network logs. Logs of the network packets that have traversed a network would help answer more questions about whether an attack is occurring and what it entails. Then you have incident response, which an incident usually refers to a data breach or cyber attack. However, in some cases, it can be something less critical, such as a misconfiguration, an intrusion attempt, or a policy violation. An example of a cyber attack includes an attacker making our network or systems inaccessible, defacing, which is changing the public website, and data breach, such as stealing company data. Now, how would you respond to a cyber attack? Incident response specifies the methodology that should be followed to handle such a case. The aim is to reduce damage and recover in the shortest time possible. Ideally, you would want to develop a plan ready for incident response. Now, the four major phases of incident response are, number one, preparation. This requires a team trained and ready to handle incidents. So ideally, various measures are put in place to prevent incidents from happening in the first place. Number two is detection and analysis. The team has the necessary resources to detect any incident. It's essential to further analyze and detect incidents to learn about its severity. Number three, containment, eradication, and recovery. Once an incident is detected, it's crucial to stop it from affecting other systems, eliminate it, and recover the affected systems. For instance, when we notice that a system is infected with the virus, we want to stop it by containing the virus from spreading to other systems, and then we want to clean or eradicate the virus and ensure that the system is properly recovered. And then last step, number four, post-incident activity. After successful recovery, a report is produced and the lessons learned is shared to prevent similar incidents in the future. Now you have malware analysis. So malware stands for malicious software. Software refers to programs, documents, and files that can save on a disk or send over the network. Malware includes many types such as a virus, which is a piece of code or part of a program that attaches itself to a program. It's designed to spread from one computer to another. It works by altering, overriding, and deleting files once it affects a computer. The results ranges from computer being slow to unusable. Now, Trojan Horse is a program that shows to be desirable but hides the malicious function underneath. For example, a victim might download a video player from a shady website that gives the attacker complete control of their system. And then you have Ransomware, which is a malicious program that encrypts the user's files. Encryption makes the files unreadable without knowing the encryption password. The attacker offers the user encryption password if the user is willing to pay a ransom. Malware analysis aims to learn about such malicious programs using various means. Number one, static analysis works by inspecting the malicious program without running it. Usually this requires solid knowledge of assembly language. And then number two, dynamic analysis works by running the malware in a controlled environment and then monitoring its activities. It lets you observe how the malware behaves when it's running. Now on to the questions. What would you call a team of cybersecurity professionals that monitors a network and a system for malicious events? This would be Security Operations Center. Now what does DFIR stand for? Digital Forensics and Incident Response. And then which kind of malware requires the user to pay money to regain access to their files? This would be ransomware. Now on to task number three. 
A task three, practical example of defensive security. What would be a typical task that you will be doing as a security analyst? Click on view site and follow along until you get the flag. So let's go ahead and view site. So it looks like we get a split screen. In this lab, you're part of a SOC responsible for protecting a bank. The bank SOC uses a SIEM or security information and event management system. This could be like Splunk, for example. A SIEM gathers security related information and events from various sources and prevents them into one system. For instance, you would be notified if there's a failed login attempt or a login attempt from an unexpected geographic location. With machine learning, a SIM might detect unusual behavior such as a user logging in at 3 a.m. when he usually logs in during work hours. In this exercise, we'll interact with the SIM to monitor different events on the network and systems in real time. Some of the events are typical and harmless, others may require further intervention from us. So we want to find the event flagged in red, take note of it, and click on it for further inspection. Next, we want to learn more about the suspicious activity or event. The suspicious event might even be triggered by an event, such as a local user, a local computer, or a remote IP address. To send and receive postal mail, you need a physical address. Similarly, you need an IP address to send and receive data over the internet. An IP address is a logical address that allows you to communicate over the internet. We inspect the cause of the trigger to confirm whether the event is indeed malicious. If it is malicious, we need to take due action such as reporting to someone else in the SOC and blocking that IP address. So the question is, what is the flag that you obtained by following along? Well, let's go ahead and start. So inspect the alerts in your SIM dashboard, find the malicious IP address from the alerts, make note of it, and then click on the alert to proceed. So we need to find the red alert. So it looks like that's green, that's red. So it looks like we need to click on the red one. It looks like we need to actually make note of the IP. How do we go back? Okay, so I'll just go ahead and highlight this. Oops, see if that copied. Now check an IP address. There are websites on the internet that allow you to check the reputation of an IP address to see whether it's malicious or suspicious. For example, one site that I like to use is called abuseipdb.com. I'll drop a link in the description. So we'll go ahead and click on the red alert, find the IP address, paste it, and then submit it. There are many open source databases out there like Abuse IPDB, that's what we just talked about, and Cisco Talos Intelligence, where you can perform a reputation and location check for the IP address. Most security analysts use these tools to aid them with alert investigations. You can also make the internet safer by reporting the malicious IPs, for example, on Abuse IPDB. Now that we know it's from China, we can go on to the next step to escalate it. So choose to whom you would escalate this event. Looks like if we're a SOC analyst, we want to alert the SOC team lead. We wouldn't want to talk to the security architect, the security consultant, or the sales executive. So we'll talk to Will. Now you got permission to block the IP address. So you can come over here to the block IP address, paste it in there, and then block it. And then it looks like we got a flag. So take that flag, submit it over here, and then there you go. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.